Dr. Shaheem Patel, uh, Assalamu Alaikum. Welcome to Radio Alansar Business Matters. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Altaf, uh, thank you so much for your warm welcome. And uh, I'm looking forward to this evening's discussion. Definitely. Um, and I think uh, myself, along with the listeners, are actually looking forward to uh, your information and your uh, guidance in terms of how do we manage the impact of, um, of the current fuel price and businesses, um, especially those businesses that are relying on transport as their core function. Uh, this is definitely going to have a grave impact. So I think it would be, uh, you know, perhaps a, a good point to start off with you giving us maybe an introduction or, uh, if I may call it in inverted commas, a history around what has happened to the fuel prices uh, in Southern Africa. Where has it uh, come from in the last couple of months? What has happened? And uh, where are we sitting at this point in time in terms of the fuel prices? Um, Shahim, if you can just maybe take us through that. Yeah, sure. And, and you know what? It's important that you touch on a region. You mentioned Southern Africa. And I think as South Africans, we sometimes get caught into this trap where we think that all the problems that we are faced with are unique to us. Uh, and in some ways, that might be the case if you look at some of the other challenges facing us at the moment. But certainly, uh, the rising cost of fuel um, is a global phenomenon. Uh, in parts of the world where you know fuel was never thought to ever be uh, a hot topic of discussion, uh, has proved to be otherwise. If you look at uh, the United States of America, for example, uh, they seeing fuel prices at record levels, uh, certainly in, in recent memory, um, and that's what the might that they've got, and they've they've done so much in the in the last few decades to try and become more independent from an. Uh, an oil perspective and from a fuel perspective. If you look into places like the Middle East, you'll see, I think in the last two weeks, you can look at places like Iran, um, you know, uh, lots of protests about rising costs of food. Uh, and on the surface, it looks like it, uh, the issue is food, but in actual fact, there's, there's, there's rising costs of fuel that's driving that those prices up. And so, and so really, it's, that's the first point. I think it's important to understand that uh, it's not a very localized issue at the moment. It, it really is uh, something that's happening across the, across the globe, and leaders are, are grappling with how to respond to this. That's point number one. I think point number two uh, is, is just to contextualize what's been happening, right? So it's important to understand that the price of fuel that we pay at the pumps when we're filling our car or our uh, motorbikes or whatever it is that we use for, uh, for transport, the price of the fuel that we pay at the pump is primarily driven by two uh, factors at a high level, right? So one is the, the exchange rate between the rand and the dollar, and the other one is the price of, of Brent crude oil, right? Uh, and and both, both are seemingly outside the scope of uh, anyone's control, really, on the surface. I mean, it, 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 it's driven at a very macro level, uh, and forces are at play which, which the ordinary person on the street like myself, uh, wouldn't have direct control over. And if we further contextualize this issue, the, the, the rising, uh, you know, or the fluctuation in the price of oil, for example, is one of the two variables that, that primarily impact on fuel prices. It's been variable for some time. If you, if you think prior to COVID, uh, they were, it, the, the, you know, the, the whole issue boils down to supply and demand, right? And so prior to COVID, there was already some kind of supply issue driving, uh, driving OPEC nations um, to say that they're going to limit supply for various reasons. They're not going to be com- continuously pumping oil at the levels that they were. And so already there were, there were uh, let's call it jitters in the, in the oil market at that point in time. Uh, and, then, and then once COVID hit, naturally, uh, you know, so many industries came to a grinding halt. And, and what that was a really, really uh, stunted demand for oil. So that impacted the dynamic even further. And now that we're coming out of a post-COVID uh, era, the demand, for, the demand for oil and for fuel is now spiking even more. So it's been a bit of a topsy-turvy few years when you look at the, the uh, price of oil and the demand and supply of oil, right? And, and really, um, if you just think back two years ago, roughly, 
oil, the price of oil was in a negative state, meaning that, you, you know, it was below zero, um, which is not a long time ago. And I think, you know, the price of oil per barrel at the moment is something north of $110, $120 per barrel. So you can clearly see that the, it's been a rocky, rocky time. Um, and it really has a downstream effect on the, on the price of, of fuel. Uh, I, I suppose I'll touch on it a bit later, but maybe the composition of how our price of fuel is made up uh, would be an important discussion just to touch on, although we're going to be talking more about how to respond to the fuel, uh, fuel hikes, uh, prices of fuel being hiked. Yeah. Um, I think it's important sometimes just to, just to touch on how the actual price is constructed because it's become a very politicized, uh, issue people, you know, talk a lot about the government uh, and, and its role in the price of oil. And people talk a lot about, you know, our neighbors. We exporting oil to to our landlocked neighbors, and they getting it so much cheaper and so forth. So there's so much going on just at a macro level. Um, but I, hopefully that sets the, a, a good basis for us to have a good discussion around sort of what is it that's causing the price of oil oil to be what it is. How does that impact the price of fuel? And then what does that mean for for businesses, for consumers, and what can we do about that? Sure. So um, in terms of the, the, the price of fuel, it's far more than just uh, what we are seeing uh, on television. There are many factors that actually contribute to that, as you said um, earlier on. So what are these factors that actually um, affect the pricing of fuel or how is it actually made up? And I think that would be very, very interesting for us to, to take note of um, as the ordinary man or the end user on, on the street when it comes to fuel. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, look, if you think about uh, anything that you sell, there's a, there's a cost involved to either manufacture that particular item or that good. Uh, there might be some markup that a, you know, a retailer or, a retailer or, or both need to make and some other factors that go into the price that the, the actual consumer pays, right? The, in essence, fuel is not much different with one major exception. Roughly, I mean, you know, don't, uh, I'm not going to really go into the details of the exact amounts, but roughly about a third of the price that we pay for fuel, um, a third of that is made up of levies and taxes that goes to the government. Now, I don't want to go into the details of it, but roughly yeah. there are two types of levies that, that, that gets uh, charged. And, and in the order of about 13 uh, charges that make up the levies and taxes in, in many ways, one of the big ones of those is the, the road accident fund. Okay. Right. So the road accident fund has almost gained some kind of notoriety in in many uh, over many years because of its mismanagement or alleged mismanagement, rather, uh, because of accusations of you know uh, uh, malfeasance, um, corruption, and and a whole a whole host of um, untoward behaviors that actually uh, creates a negative perception around the road accident fund on its own. Right. So that's roughly uh, the order of where some of the taxes and levies go to in the order of about uh, one third of what we what we'd normally pay. Just just a little bit less than half of our actual fuel is is the actual cost of the fuel, the actual uh, the price that the, the the cost of sale, as it were, right? And then roughly about 14, 15 percent, depending, maybe a bit more, maybe a bit less, that goes to the margins for retail and wholesalers. Uh, and then there's a small amount with the remainder, probably what is six percent or, or, or thereabouts, uh, which is for storage and distribution costs of fuel. So, uh, in a very rudimentary way, that's the, the high-level skeleton of how the, the prices are, uh, or rather, how the actual final price is constructed. And this changes all the time. Uh, if you just think about every budget speech that our finance minister makes, uh, uh, sort of February, March of each year. Um, that will that will impact what the the levies and the taxes might look like, um, and so and so you know just during the year we every every month, uh, usually on the first of every uh, first Wednesday of every month, um, there's a there's a change in the fuel price either upward or downward depending on the price of fuel for that month. I mean, beg your pardon, uh, the price of oil for that month, uh, and and you know the the other factors and variables that go into it like uh, logistics and and supply chain and so forth. So that's the that's the real uh, structure and, and uh, how our uh, fuel is priced uh, at the moment in in South Africa. Okay, um, so uh, Dr. Shahim Patel, I think that 
uh, gives us a very good summary in terms of what the you know the structure um, of of the fuel price is and where it comes from and and the basis uh, gives us a clearer understanding in terms of uh, where it comes from. Um, just very quickly, um, which which sectors now from your um, experience, which sectors of the economy have actually been hardest hit by the the, the fuel price hikes? Yeah, you know it's it's. It's a very difficult question to ask because there's, you can almost argue that every single industry, every single sector has been hit in a, a severe way, in a, uh, in a real way, and some more than others. One would imagine that if you are in a business that is in trade, i.e. selling of goods, something physical that needs to move from point A to point B, uh, then automatically those businesses would be uh, harder hit by the fuel prices uh, rather than a service business. So, so if you if you look at it, a goods trading business versus a service business, naturally one would assume that the the trading businesses are feeling it a bit more. But that's not to say that uh, you know that's the end of the story. If you think about um, you know travel, tourism, right, and 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 not just land tourism where people get in a car and fill, fill up a tank of fuel to go from Joburg to Durban for a week. Uh, I'm talking about just globally, tra- air travel, uh, sea travel, uh, basically any form of commute uh, is, is, is feeling the pinch in terms of the increased level of, of oil and fuel prices. If I have to take it a, little, a bit of a level lower than just an industry perhaps and talk about the man on the street. Yeah. In South Africa, you know, there's several, so many homes that are unelectrified. And so they rely for, for the purposes of cooking, just for something as basic as cooking, they rely on paraffin and oils and, and so forth to, to make sure that food is on the table each day. And, and uh, you know, I was reading some, some days back, um, something to the tune of about 65 or 60, I beg your, I beg your pardon, 70, 75% of homes in South Africa fall into that category. So it becomes it becomes very, very real when you say well for the industry, but it's also below the industry. Uh, if I think of, if I take it now back one level up, sorry, I just deviated for a second. But if you look at farming, uh, farming is another one that's feeling the pinch and they in particular because many times farmers are being uh, prevented from passing on the increased cost to the consumer. Purely because of the way that the contracts are negotiated with, uh, you know, wholesalers, retailers, and so forth. So, so the farmers are being hamstrung, um, and their prices are really hitting their bottom line because no matter what type of farming you involve in, you need to pay for feed, and feed costs money to move from, you know, the big city to a farm, and typically it's not one trip, it's... Uh, you know, move from point A to point B to point C and perhaps then to the farm. Uh, and, and that becomes a challenge in its own right. Uh, another one is the public transport industry. I mean, again, it's, it's just a vehicle that needs to move, right? But if you think about uh, buses, um, you know, public transport, people using buses, those costs are being passed on to the consumer directly. Uh, again, something I read about a, about a week ago, Roughly two-thirds of South African households um, use 20% of their income on transport, on public transport. That's a lot of money. So that industry in its own right is, is an economy of its own, if you really think about it. Uh, and it's a direct impact uh, that, that, that the fuel is having on that particular industry. And I suppose lastly, you know, just another example of an industry being hard hit by the, by the fuel crisis is just the motor industry in general. Whether you're selling cars, uh, whether you are in the man- uh, repairing cars, uh, whether you just have a car and you drive it from, from home to work every day, just motoring in general has naturally been hit very hard as well. 
So on a high level, I think those are some of the industries and sectors of the economy that are feeling the pinch quite hard as a result of uh, the increased fuel prices. Um, thank you very much for that, um, Dr. Patel. So evidently, um, you know, the crisis is far and wide. It's reaching everybody. It's reaching um, potentially every industry, um, the man on the street, um, whether you're selling, whether you're in the transport industry, uh, a user, an end user. So it's the, the impact is grave. And um, um, of course, um, we now need to start thinking of how to respond to to the the ever increasing uh, fuel prices. Um, so, what what has actually uh, been some of the responses from from businesses in terms of these price hikes, um, uh, Shahim? Yeah, so you know, I think a lot of businesses, that in my observation, in and in conversation with several business leaders um, in different forums. I think that they're focusing on the two main drivers of profit, right? Which is management of costs and management of revenue. And looking at those two particular levers and thinking which one of the two will give me the best bang for buck on the back of a fuel crisis. And, and, and I, think it, I don't think it's unfair to call it a fuel crisis, by the way, because I think that uh, if you look at just what's happened w- with the price of fuel in, in recent times, I think it's fair to call it that. But be that as it may, irrespective of the, of the terminology one chooses to use, um, the innovation has generally been around, along those two levers. How do I manage costs and how do I manage revenue? And so if you d- dig one level deeper, um, it's a case of, well, I've got two types of costs, right? I've got variable costs and I've got uh, fixed costs, right? So now it's a case of, well, you know, small to medium-sized business owners, uh, are, are scratching their heads, asking one another of the fixed costs. I'm already, I'm already in a difficult situation anyway. Uh, on the back of COVID-19, uh, certain parts of the country, especially KZN, on the back of two rounds of maybe flooding. Um, I, I'm, already, I'm already facing a difficult task in managing costs in, in the first place, whether that be fixed cost or variable cost. But, but what I what I find is that um, you know. Most most businesses have tended to pass on the cost to the consumer, which is, I suppose, in some ways, it's not unfair. It's fair, but it's also not fair. <laughs> it's not fair to the consumer because, you know, uh, the consumer in South Africa, and again, we, we, we try not to localize the problem too much, but uh, the South African consumer has been battered and bruised for a long, long time. And it just seems as though there's no way out of this whirlpool and, and, you know, several people are drowning in debt. Um, not, somebody spoke about, somebody spoke about the, the percentage of people who get paid and spend their salary within five days of getting paid. I don't know the figure, but it was north of 50% definitely. I said to myself, well, wow, how, how, how do you actually still add more misery to the situation, you know? Yeah. So, so several businesses have been doing that. It's passing the cost on to the consumer. And, and then you still get further businesses. It's a little bit difficult to really discern why, but so, you know, if, one could argue it's either on the back of uh, the shadow of uh, COVID-19, yeah. or it's because of uh, rising fuel costs, or it's a mix of problems. But the solution for those business owners is to close up shop. Uh, they just have no choice. Yeah, and and, you know, and, and they... yeah, with that we have a loss of jobs. So, you know, I, I just have I had a follow up uh, comment and a question: Is that um, aside from from you know the, the the people or the man in the street that's bearing the brunt? Um, there are many people that are putting food on the table and they are the breadwinners. And like you've said, uh, businesses have to close their doors; they have to close shop because that's that seems to be the only uh, way out of um, the, the the crisis. And then that that basically leaves people out of a job. Job and um, that that still is uh, you know contributing now to to poverty and and crippling uh, families uh, far and wide. So you've made a very very important point there. Yeah, unemployment is a whole other beast to tackle. You know, and and, and it requires an analysis altogether. But you're absolutely right because the knock-on effect. People call it the multiplier effect uh, when you know you have a problem with one thing like fuel and it causes problems in the price of food and price of a whole bunch of other mix of goods and eventually you have issues like unemployment which increases even further it's absolutely it's an absolutely valid argument to make 
Uh, and, and I don't think South Africa and the South African economy can afford to take more of these hits. So the, the real answer to the question then is what is government's role in all of this? Absolutely. Um, it, it opens up, you know, it reopens the discussion about a politicizing of uh, an issue which on the surface is not a political issue. But I think it's very difficult to avoid the role that government ought to be playing. Aside from, you know, levies and taxes in the fuel price, if you look beyond that, from a structural point of view, in the economy, how does a government invest in infrastructure to address this kind of an issue? So let's take a very simple example. South Africa is plagued by potholes on our, on our road system. Yeah, there's an, all too familiar. There's an element of... There's an element of that of that pothole issue having a relationship with the fuel of price, uh, with the price, price of, fuel. of fuel. Because you, you know, if we have safer roads, if we have more smoother roads, we would we would not be spending money on uh, car repairs in a small business, which a small business cannot afford to have. And that of money course, would be able to absorb a deeper yeah, shock yeah. Uh, and prevent, um, you know further job losses and so forth. So I don't want to to make it into an infrastructure discussion, but certainly the role of infrastructure development in South Africa has a very close link to the price of fuel, has a very close link to inflation, has a very close link to the price of the the US dollar and the the rand exchange rate, and a whole series of other issues that sit beneath that, uh, which all contributes to unemployment. Okay. Dr. Shane Patel, it's Anwar Mullah. I've been listening attentively to what you've had to say. And I, I think we all know what the problems are in that the, we've got the uh, the fuel increases. And uh, from what I've just read, they, there's expected to be further fuel increases coming through next month as well in July, besides the 75 cents, which uh, which is the levy that's going to be put on. Um, the expectation is that petrol is going to go up by another two rand and diesel somewhere in the region of about one rand ten again. So we're in for further problems, uh, further holes in the pockets of consumers. But we've come to the stage where we need to break, I think, for the nine o'clock news. And uh, I think when we come back, maybe we can explore together some of the solutions uh, or, or if they're not solution, but some what we can do to, to ease the burden in the pocket because it's the consumers that the very lowest rung of the LSM, if you want to call it that, they're the most hardly hit because they, they depend on public transport and the most, uh, the most of their income is spent on things like transportation, etc. And as you rightly said, paraffin to, 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 uh, to cook the food at home. So unfortunately, it's the poorest that are always the hardest hit and uh, what type of solutions we can come up with for them. So let's, let's break for the news and then we come back and explore some solutions.